Uh, hi, Vibha. So, thank you for coming here. Thanks for taking the time to coming and having uh, having this chat with me. Um, so, Vibha, as you know, I I know that as a partner at Druva Advisors, you've worked with many corporates and many families in terms of their taxation, uh, succession planning, M and A transactions, and so on and so forth. So, you know, Vibha, we've kind of worked together uh, in the in the past. You know, as you're aware, we run a multi-family office, and we've you know work together with few of the families either mm-hmm. on succession trust formation uh we work together on a family settlement yeah um you know so we've uh, we've we've done a lot of work over the last few years mm-hmm. um and as a multi family office essentially we do three things right one we need to preserve the capital second we need to grow the capital and the third is that we need to make the capital transfer to the next generation in a smooth and Absolutely. efficient manner yeah right so now when we are looking at this couple of things come up right so one is of course diversification mm-hmm. um and when we look at family offices it's not diversification across asset classes right it's also i would say across geographies right now to add to this a lot of the families uh, their business are becoming global right the next generation you know they 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 almost like global citizens right they're not right. confined by any physical boundaries so it's it's very interesting to see this uh you know see this trend in uh, family offices where they want to access the the international markets and the global markets both from an investment as well as a business perspective and you know what was interesting to see was the move by the government and even they are encouraging indian entrepreneurs to go and take on the global stage and one of the most talked about things is the ifsc the gift city right yeah and uh, you know i think it's a very interesting topic and i know you guys are doing a lot of a uh, uh, lot of work in this at uh, at druva advisors so uh, you know I, i think it'll be good if we can have a have a discussion around that would love to get your thoughts on it what is it what's happening why is it being set up so as we you know go about advising a lot of families around succession structures and family office structures this gift city has really come up indeed as a very very promising kind of a structure so so gift city is nothing but it's a it's it's a space in gandhinagar where they've set up it, it is set up as a special economic zone okay uh the idea really is to promote financial services entities setting up shops there whether it is funds banking units the national stock exchange has set up shop in the gift city yes. already uh and so sometime last year they came up with a regulation called the fund management entity regulation so until then we had the aifs in the gift city like a cat 1 cat 2 cat 3 just like we have domestic aifs but then they replaced all of that regulation with this fund management entity regulation where in addition to the aifs which is more third party pooled money they've also brought in a concept of a single family office which they call a family investment fund okay. where a, a single family can set up a fund in the gift city populate that with money and then this can be used as a family office structure for investing now this fund can be set up using resident money and we used to invest offshore also likewise it can also be set up using offshore money coming into india and being invested into india so what they are trying to do is to give you a platform where you've got a formal structure in the gift city okay. for setting up a family office and running it professionally okay so so i and so you know i i read about these regulations last year they came in last year and i think some amendments uh, or some additions were done in march this year yeah but all of a sudden it's become popular now right mm. so i i'm i'm sure there's this there's something more people were aware of the regulation it's been talked about not only now but previously i think there are two things really one is that if you look at it from a governance governance perspective they are trying to position this as an alternative to a singapore family office or a dubai family office a hong kong family office okay. like an offshore family office okay. so they want to promote it that phase right okay. and second and more importantly to your to your question rahul on why it has suddenly caught the fancy yeah. of families is that we know the overseas investment regulation and the lrs regulation got yeah. amended last year in august yeah. right and while it might look that it has been liberalized from a financial services perspective to be able to you know uh, move money offshore and use it for financial investments but if you really go down into the details of of the new regulations right uh, let us l- look at the lrs 
they've made it a bit more restrictive now. Hmm. One is this 180 day rule where if you have unutilized money, then you have to bring it back to India. Right. right? Yes. Second is this entire aspect on whether you can do unlisted debt or not now. Yeah. So while earlier you could have done unlisted debt using LRS, now it is not possible under the new regulation. And the third most critical part there is this entire aspect of being able to invest into funds overseas. Hmm. where there is this confusion around whether a fund is registered outside India or the fund manager is registered outside India. Right. And typically it's the fund manager which is registered outside India. Whereas the law says that you can invest into a fund which is registered outside India. Right. And because of that ambiguity, people are a, a bit scary, scared of hmm. whether or not they can invest into a fund. Also from a perspective of why again why it has become popular. Also yeah. if you look at ODI, right, which yeah. is the Overseas Direct Investment yeah. Route. while the law, the new ODI regulation says that even a company which is not engaged in financial services in India today can set up a subsidiary outside India which can be engaged in financial services, right? And yes. be your track record. Yes. But it's an automatic route that they have uh -huh. permitted. But a big question mark that has come up, uh -huh. and this is in you know coming from the RBI itself, is that if the overseas subsidiary is going to be engaged in financial investment activity, right? Investment and lending. Yeah. Somewhere the feeling and somewhere the messaging from the RBI is that whether it is bona fide business activity itself or not, which is the prime requirement for doing ODI. And if they are putting that itself into question, then is this route feasible at all or not? Okay. So, you know, com coming back to Give City, so I, I understand there were you know, three three categories of uh, under the fund management regulation, mm -hmm. right? So there, there there were the authorized FME, there was the uh, restricted scheme retail and restricted scheme non retail. I think right. we are we are more concerned around the authorized fund manager under which you can do the family investment fund, right? That's right. So you know, so what can you tell me a little bit? Give me an overview of this regime on the regulation itself. So a family investment fund is classified as an authorized FMB. Okay. And what that means is that because it is a fund which is owned by a single family, and I'll just talk about what a single family means, etc. Mm. The fund doesn't require a separate fund manager. So the fund manager and the fund are the same entities really, because there's no third party money which is being pooled. And this fund can be set up either as a company or an LLP or a trust. So that flexibility is available with families to choose what they want to do. Now, who can really invest into this fund? Yeah. Right? That becomes important. Yes. Uh, from two perspectives. One is who are eligible investors? And secondly, what are the limits of investment? Mm. Right. Now, in terms of eligible investors, they've said that it's a single family which can invest into this fund. And the way they've defined a single family and that definition got expanded in March is that it's a family with the same lineage really, you know, same ascendants yes. and descendants. So effectively they are, they don't want any third parties and extended family members to become part of this, right? And secondly, uh, they expanded this definition of single family to also include entities like a company or a LLP or a partnership firm or even a trust where at least 90% of the ownership is with this single family. So, so hold on. So what, so what this means is, for example, if I want to set up a FIF in the gift city, mm -hmm. um, I have a, say, a LLP uh, mm -hmm. in which me and my family are 90% shareholder. Yeah. That LLP can set up the FIF in the gift city. That's right. It can invest into the FIF. Okay. Okay. So, okay. So from that perspective, then it then it it, it gives a lot of flexibility, right? Because now my quantum increases, Absolutely. my flexibility increases. Yeah. So what what would be exactly be those flexibilities? What would be the key benefits by us? So the way it works is that if you have individuals who are Indian residents, mm -hmm. if they have to invest into this FIF, yeah, they will use their LRS limits, because this FIF, yeah. while being Indian territory physically, is treated offshore. Okay. So the moment an Indian resident invests into this FIF, yeah. that is treated like an offshore investment and governed by the FEMA provisions. 
So I will still have to pay the 20% TCS? You will still have to pay the 20% TCS because it is LRS. If you have an LLP or a corporate entity and yeah. if they are investing into the FIF, it is allowed as a overseas portfolio investment, OPI is what we say. Okay. Which means that they can use up to 50% of net worth, of their net worth on the books and invest uh, that much amount into this FIF. And no TCS. And no TCS. So where all can the FIF invest? Right, so I I am a family. Now, what can this FIF do? Like, right? what hmm. what are the asset classes? Are there any minimum, maximum? Are there any restrictions around it? Yeah. So they've defined the various asset classes into which this FIF can invest. Okay, that's part of the FME regulation, and that classification is quite broad. Okay, so okay. it could do listed equities, it could do unlisted equities, listed debt, unlisted debt. It could even do real estate, physical real estate, I mean. It oh, could okay. invest into offshore funds. It could also do, you know, artwork, paintings, jewelry, bullion. So a lot of those things are possible. So the FIF can directly hold real estate? Yes. It doesn't have to go through a corporate structure to mm -hmm. hold the... So you could also oh. technically borrow into this FIF and use that money. So the capital which is available for investment, yeah. you could do a debt equity and you could... Uh, expand that capital and invest. Which as an individual because of FEMA regulations right. I cannot. Correct. Right. Okay. And so okay, so I've I've made these investments, right? And I've and I've got I've got gains around this. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've got dividend, I've got capital gain, I've got interest income, right. uh, you know, rental income, right, or what have you. Now, how is this FIF taxed? So very interestingly, the law provides an income tax law in India. Because this FIF is treated as an Indian tax resident entity. So while okay. from a FEMA perspective, it is treated offshore. But from a tax perspective, it's an Indian tax resident entity. Right? Okay. Now to encourage and promote this entire regime, uh, the law provides for a 100% tax holiday for 10 years. And that is a generic tax holiday available to any unit set up in the IFSC. And hence that's available to this FIF as well. Mm -hmm. So which basically means that in a block of first 15 years of setup, you can choose any 10 consecutive years for availing this tax holiday, in which period of time any income that the FIF gets, right, that is exempt from any income taxes. Income can be defined as capital gain, can be defined yeah. as dividend, can be defined as interest income. Interest, so all, all, all this is income, it's not just right. a, a revenue that I get from Correct. operating company. Okay, all right, so how how much would I have to spend? What's the net worth requirement for me to set up a FIF? Is there any minimum, uh, you know, amount that, that, mm -hmm. that I need to keep? Because I know uh, other FMEs, the fund management regulation for others, it has some requirement. What is it for the FIF in terms of net worth and the corpus that F the FIF should So have? the only requirement really is that within a period of three years of setup, yeah. you should have a minimum corpus of $10 million which is by way of funding into the FIF from, from the uh, unit holders, the investors. Okay. There, there, there is a very, um, a, a very strong concern of POEM, right? Which is place of effective management. Mm -hmm. uh, and in most of the offshore structures, that's, that's something right. that uh, all the regulators look at. So how does that get addressed here? And, you know, you know while I know what a, a POEM is, it would be good to kind of hear from you how is a poem defined and what implications will this regulation have on FIF uh, in the gift city? So interestingly, if you look at poem, place of effective management, it basically applies on a foreign company. Okay. So if there is a foreign company and which is effectively managed from India, that is when the tax law says that the poem is in India and hence that foreign company is deemed to be an Indian tax resident. Right? Okay. And FIF, as I said, is an Indian tax resident entity. Ah. So there is no concept of poem which is True. applicable on an, on an FIF. It is, it is an Indian tax resident entity. So we don't need to worry about poem and all of that. Of course, one needs to look at the substance requirements that we need to you know, set up in the gift city itself yeah. physically. So all of that has to be uh, you know, complied with. But okay. purely from a poem perspective, this is the poem provisions itself are not applicable. Look at a substance requirement. I know there's infrastructure already made in Gift City, so I'll probably have to do office or something. But can you can you give us some flavor on 
what the substance requirement may, if more my clients are looking at setting up a FIF? One is you need to have a physical office space in the city. Okay. okay. Which means you need to lease a space and there are enough and more buildings which have come up in the Gift City. In fact, we went physically, we had meetings with the Gift City officials a couple mm. of months ago. And the place has really come up well and it is of course evolving, but it has come up well. There are you know good quality buildings. The FSC Authority office itself is a premium grade A office. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you have to lease office yeah. space and you have to have one officer mm. with some fund management experience who needs to be locally based there. Okay. So for a for a family investment fund, they have kept the substance requirements to a bare minimum. Because there's just one family, it's it is not just a detailed family, money or right. a credit investor. Right. right. Okay. So the, clearly, a lot of flexibilities that have been built into that. That's right. That system there, and I I know from a practical perspective, you are advising some families, and you know we have been discussing FI for some of uh, mm. you know so for some of our families that we that we work with. Um, how long does the application take? What typically are the costs you can look at, uh, right? And since you've been through it practically, you know, any insights that you have into the process, that that will be very great to know. Sure. So, as things stand today, you basically require two registrations or two approvals. Okay. okay. One is a registration with the IFSC authority. Okay. okay. Which is more like a license to operate as an FIF. And second, because the gift city is a special economic zone, mm. you need a unit approval from the unit approval committee, which is the right. SEZ law. Okay. And that is more to get space there and be registered as an SEZ unit. So these are the two broad approvals that are required. And in terms of time frame, in, in our experience, what we've seen is that one should budget a timeline of about four to six months for the approval process to come through. Okay. Now the government is also working at the same time in parallel on making this a single window clearance and moving things on approval entirely to the IFSC authority. Once that happens, then one should expect the uh, timelines to get shortened. Okay, okay. Because then with the single window, it becomes right. useful. So essentially the, the pain point, you know, at least, at, least, at least for the clients we have, the pain point that we address is that one, now we can have higher quantums to invest outside India mm. uh, because we go through a uh, through through a corporate entity if we do that at all. Uh, second is this TCS goes away. Mm. I have no restrictions in terms of what I can buy. I can hold real estate. I can hold bullion. I am saving myself from some succession estate duty in in in, in uh, you know especially countries like US etc. Right. It's, it's very high. Uh, and at the same time, sorry to uh, stop you there, uh, Raul, at the same time, even from an Indian perspective, you you can still make your succession plan. So this yeah. doesn't interfere with your succession plan. So right. you could typically have a structure where you have a family trust in India sitting at the top of this structure yeah. above your, you know, above the company or the LLP that is funding the FIF. So you Correct. could technically have the family trust sitting uh, above the structure. So now it becomes even more efficient in terms of uh, succession planning. Okay, that's that's uh, that's good to know. Going forward, right? Uh, what are you seeing? You know, why are families looking at this more? And going forward, how do you see the regulations uh, change? Any 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 kind of insights into that? Because I know you you deal with the regulators also quite a lot, right? So what what are they thinking? What's the intent behind it, right? Because that's very important as we uh, go no, forward. No, absolutely. So I think the intent really is. To make this a very vibrant ecosystem at okay. the Gift City. Okay. <clears throat> it is not just about having Indian families setting up family offices there and investing offshore, hmm. right? But while well, that is clearly one of the objectives, but also the larger objective also is to have offshore funds setting up shops in the Gift City uh -huh. and then using that to invest into India. So and, and there is traction already there. There are a number of funds which have already been set up in the Gift City. So in that sense, the objective and the intent of the government looks to be promoting this as an alternative financial center to a Singapore mm. or a Mauritius where today if you see the, they are one of the top FDI inflow destinations into India, yeah. right? And hence, the government, one should expect the government to be very, very supportive of this entire process, right? Okay. Uh, the authorities are very welcoming. Uh, they are open to meet, discuss address queries and address any concerns that people may have. Mm. Okay. In fact, 
we've had clients uh, come with us and and meet the authorities oh very nice I also understand is all this is at a fraction of a cost of a dubai or singapore That's or right. a... so in fact the cost structure has just come up a couple of days ago okay uh, in you know and to put a very very nominal cost so uh, for a family investment fund mm. application cost is some $2500 okay and then at the time of license there is a $15000 cost so it's it's really uh, a very very nominal cost that they have come up with which is more to be paid to the authorities thanks sir i think this this is a very useful discussion and uh, i think this is going to add a lot of value to uh, you know me and my clients um it's quite it, it's it's really encouraging to see uh you know something like a gift city come up and you know giving all these benefits so that a family can set up a inheritance friendly structure get access to global uh, you know global innovation global investments um and w- what it looks like from our discussion is that the the while the government has formed this with a clear intent i think you know this the the, the sense i get is that they're going to make the regulations even more conducive towards doing that and they're very open to feedback they're very open the thought is they're very open to feedback oh, and the discussion absolutely so that's what one should definitely expect yeah so that's uh, that's good i think uh, i'm really looking forward to working on on setting up some fis with you definitely i look forward uh, thank you so much thank you thank you, thank you. Yeah.